your sin, all your sorrow and your sadness. There's a Savior and He calls. Bring it all to the table. Bring it all to the table. So, Father, we breathe you in this morning. And we thank you for your invitation to meet you at the table. And Lord, as we talk together and as we listen, may the words of our lips and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, my name's Chris, and I'm the pastor of Community Life. Um, I know that some of you know that already, and some of you have um, kind of been here as we've been doing this sermon series on community for the past several weeks. And we've just been talking about how important it is to be in spiritual community, how important it is to be connected, and how really... um, it, how important it is for our faith formation, how important it is for our relationship with God, and, and not just how important it is, but we've also been working on ways to practice that and participate in that. Uh, and I think, you know, as I think about this, and I'm passionate about this and really am excited about it, I also start to think about how passionate God is about this and how much he wants to be in relationship with us and how he desires us to be in relationship with each other as well. So we're going to continue talking about this today. And today we are going to talk about eating. So I know some of you are like, glad I came today. We're talking about eating. Um, Yeah, we're going to talk about eating. Eating is something that all of us do, I hope, right? Something that all of us do every day. Um, Eating is something we do multiple times a day. Some of us more than others, and that's okay. I'm not up here to judge. Um, We do it with people, we do it by ourselves, we do it on the go, we do it slowly and kind of savoring every bite. We make food, we buy food, we grow food. Eating is something that we're all very familiar with, I would think. So here's what I want you to do. This morning, I want you to picture, so go ahead and close your eyes, and I want you to picture your favorite meal. Picture your favorite meal. For me, it's a rack of barbecue ribs from one of my favorite places in KC. Okay, picture your favorite meal. Now, picture yourself eating that together with your family and friends, sharing bites, enjoying drinks, laughing, sharing, maybe shouting, laughing some more. How are you feeling? Are you feeling good? Now, very quickly, imagine eating the same meal by yourself in a quiet room. Just you. How are you feeling now? I bet it doesn't taste quite as good because there's just something about eating together and those memories that are created and those stories that are shared in those moments. And it just does something to you, right? You can go ahead and open your eyes. So today we're talking about food, but we're also going to talk about how important it is for those in spiritual community to posture themselves around the table, okay? So I'm going to be talking about three different postures that we take around the table, but I believe the good news can be embodied in something as simple as sharing a meal with someone. You know, most of the time when we think of Jesus, I think we think of Jesus and we forget a little bit about his humanity. We start thinking about his miracles, his spectacular acts of raising somebody from the dead or healing somebody uh, or his death and his resurrection and all these great moments that are Uh, a part of who Jesus is too, but we we tend to forget a little bit about his humanity. And so I think sometimes we forget that Jesus actually had to eat 
right? He had to participate in these common, mundane, everyday, ordinary acts like eating. And also, he had to do things that take place after eating, like burping, so. <laughs> in, the, in the Gospels, um, Jesus actually ate quite a bit. And there's, there's these recordings of him eating quite a bit. There are 13 different gospel references where Jesus was eating with others. And that doesn't include when those references are repeated in different gospels. So some of these were just with his disciples. Some of them were with sinners and tax collectors. Some with Pharisees, some with large crowds of people. Some before his death and some after his death. That's kind of interesting. Jesus is participating in eating after his death. Then he also goes on to share multiple parables about eating, right? Like this is huge theme in a lot of his parables. Uh, eating, planting, washing, banquets, harvesting, parties. So I hope you can see that um, gathering and eating around a table was a foundational part of life in this period. I mean, it is today, but I think in that in that time period, it was really a big deal to do that together. So today we're going to read uh, three stories about Jesus. We're going to read three stories about him eating, and this is going to help us see three different postures that take place around the table. The first posture is the posture of pouring yourself out. The second posture is the posture of presence, and the third is the posture of participation. So, when I was in college, I, I remember, there's some distinct memories that I have when I was in college, but one of my most distinct memories is one of the first days that I arrived on campus. And I remember walking into the cafeteria, and I didn't go to a huge school, but it was bigger than the one that I uh, had graduated from in high school. And I remember walking into this cafeteria, and as I walked in there, there were so many people, right? So many people were there and they were all eating together and laughing. It was noisy and chaotic and kind of crazy. But I walked in and I knew nobody. And I just remember in that moment of thinking, I feel so alone right now. I know nobody in this cafeteria. And it seems like all these people somehow got here three weeks earlier and met each other and they're all friends and I'm not. And so I'm sitting here and I'm getting my plate of food and I'm thinking, you know, as I'm getting my plate of food, I'm kind of scouting out these different spaces of like, where can I sit? Is there somebody else sitting by themselves maybe? And I'm putting stuff on my plate and I'm thinking, where should I, where should I do? So I remember going and sitting at the end of this long table and there was a group of people sitting down from me and I'm kind of sitting here by myself and I'm eating. And, um, and I just remember thinking, hmm, what should I do? <laughs> and so I got on my phone and I kind of was on my phone and I was eating and I was kind of eavesdropping on their conversation over here as they're sharing stories and laughing. And, and I just remember being in this place where there were so many people, but yet feeling so alone. And so today, I don't want to eat alone today. I don't want to eat alone. So I'm going to invite my friend Lynn up and Lynn is going to come up here and she's going to eat with me this morning. Would you guys give Lynn a hand for just being willing to, to try this? Lynn, Chris? how are you doing? I'm good. Good. I have to use a microphone. Yeah, you go ahead and use a microphone. I've never eaten with a microphone before. That is perfect. That's the, that's the perfect way to use it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the table here for us a little bit, if you don't okay. mind. So. Um, Lynn, how was, your, how was your week? My week is good. Good. How is your dog, Toby? Lynn has a dog, Toby. <laughs> Everybody <who> is, knows Toby. <laughs> everyone knows Toby. He's a big old German shepherd. And he rides around the back of Lynn's car. It's awesome. Yeah. Pretty much goes everywhere with Lynn. Um, Lynn, I'm going to have you read the scripture passage for us. It's from Matthew 9, 19 through 13. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit. Okay, okay. Okay. And while you read it, I'm going to, I'm going to get, get dinner ready or snack ready for us. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, 
Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. I gave you some bread and some juice oh, there for you, you if you want. So You got some juice? Uh, no, I'd love well, some, though. Thank you. Well, then I got to give you some juice. There's not a lot in there, so just, you know, we got to hey, be careful Hey, hey, I know, I know you're heavy on this stuff, but, <laughs> but it's okay. You can't have too heavy of a pour here. There. Can't have too heavy of Thank a pour. Thank you. Okay. Are you going to eat off of the plate? I, I am going to eat off of this, if that's uh, okay. okay. You know. All right. <laughs> Um, so, Lynn, tell me something that sticks out to you in this text about community. I mean, I have a few thoughts, but I'd love to hear from you. Okay. So, it seems to me that Jesus hanging out with tax collectors and sinners is kind of something like um, people from small towns hanging out with people from big cities. It's kind of like Democrats hanging out with Republicans and vice versa. And getting those disparate people together I think it basically only works if we recognize, as the Gospels teach us, that God loves absolutely everybody, that God loves the righteous, God loves the sinners, and God loves the, um, let's call them non-binaries, the people who are both righteous and both sinners as well. So that's what I was thinking about that. I think that's great. Yeah, that's, you know, you should be preaching instead of me, I think. So no, 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 no. Um, no, I think you're exactly right. I mean, it, it seems, I think something that sticks out to me is, is Jesus' willingness to eat with people who are different than him, right? And I, I, you kind of said that. But as Jesus is at this table, these people are from all different walks of life and coming to that table with all sorts of crap, right, that are going on in their life. And so... I, I love I love what you said right there. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna throw up this image here on the screen, and this is an image from a guy named Scott the Painter, and he's one of my favorite artists. And um, yeah, as you're looking at this image, Lynn, what what do you like about it? Well, I thought this was really cool. I did not know about Scott the Painter. I didn't. I haven't seen this image before, but. Um, my first thought was that I liked it because obviously they're parts of human beings, but they are connected to each other. That's really cool. Um, and they seem to be connected very willingly. And then you look out a little farther, and all uh, each of the three entities, persons, beings, what have you, are pouring out into a cup but they're not pouring into their cup, they're pouring into the cup of the person next to them. So obviously, it's about people pouring themselves out on behalf of or with other people as well. And I think obviously too, um, at least I hope I'm right, I think this, this was intended to be an image of the Trinity. Each of the members pouring him, her, themselves out for the other and everybody connected tightly together. So that's what I saw. That is fantastic, Lynn. I want you guys to know that this is not scripted. Like nope. I gave her some questions and she's coming up with these amazing answers. So No, it's just is, what anybody would see if they're looking no, at it. But that is, is really a cool piece of art. I like it. It is. It is a cool piece of art. Would you guys give Lynn a huge hand? Thank you, Lynn, for being up here. I'll take that from you. If you want to, could you take the thing? Sure. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, as she said, this image is a great representation of what it means to be in relationship and to pour yourself out, right? They're pouring into the cup of the person next to him. So their cup is not not empty because, you know, I think sometimes we get worried because, oh, if I don't pour into my cup, then who's going to fill my cup? But there's this outpouring of themselves into the person next to them, and they're being filled by the person next to them, which creates this unique interdependence. Um, you know, we live in a culture uh, that values individualism, right? Um, and what's crazy is we have more ways to be connected in our culture than ever before. 
and yet we are probably the least connected and most lonely um, than we have than we have ever been. I think that's probably true for most of us. Um, you know, there's this there's this. Uh, I thought this was really funny. What we think the zombie apocalypse looks like and what it actually looks like. Just like a, that's a good representation of what's going on here. Um, but, you know, I think when you look at that, uh, that far uh, right image, you see some young people. But I don't think it's just young people. I think this is true across the board for most people now. Most people are glued to their phones, and that's really where they find a lot of their social connection. And I'm not saying you can't do that. I don't want to, I'm not here to harp on technology and tell you not to be on your phones. But I do think there is something unique about that. Um, you know, we talked about in, interdependent um, versus independent. And so as we look at this picture, we see that these three are interdependent. They are depending on one another. Yet we have become substantially more independent, which is really a positive value when you think about it in our culture. This is a value that we really um, long for. But unfortunately, the effect has been less interdependence where we rely upon each other. So when you're independent, you control your own outcomes, right? You make the decisions, you listen to what you want to listen to. You may think, well, great. I don't want to rely on someone else. Like I am an independent person and I, and I want to be independent. But what this has created, it's a culture of expert opinions where we stick our fingers into our ears and we shout, I'm right and you're wrong across the keys of a message board. What this has created is a culture of idolatry. Now I know what you're thinking, like idolatry, that doesn't sound like idolatry. I don't have a a wooden carved image at home that I bow down to and worship, right? But I love this definition of idolatry from Rabbi Nahum Ward Lev. He says this, the fundamental fault of idolatry is that idolatry is essentially a human monologue. Idols don't speak and humans don't listen. Idols don't speak and humans don't listen. So I don't know if that changes your perspective on what you've treated as an idol or maybe who you've treated as an idol. Idolatry is a static system Idolatrous people speak, but they don't listen and therefore don't learn, right? When you don't listen, you don't learn, and therefore when you don't learn, you don't grow, but you remain trapped in your own preconceived way of being afraid. I think this is really where it stems from, is you're afraid that you're going to lose control. And when I say you, I'm saying you and me included in that. (laughs) He goes on to say this, uh, dialogue is how an intimate, relationship evolves from day to day. A dialogue requires listening on both sides. And for some of you who have been married, you might know how true this is, right? You, you can't just tell the person what they should think and what they should do, but you're also listening to them as well. So dialogue is really how, in, how a relationship evolves from day to day. We've forgotten how to listen. We live in a world of monologue where all we can hear is our own voice. But here's the good news. The table brings us to a posture of pouring ourselves out. As we sup with people who are different than us, as we listen to their stories, as we learn from one another, and that is exactly what Jesus is doing in this story, right? Jesus is sitting with those who are different than him. I love what Lynn said about uh, Republican or Democrat or uh, mask or no mask, you know, whatever it is. Jesus is sitting with these people who are different than him, who believe different than him. And what he's doing is he's sitting there and he's breaking bread and he's pouring wine and he's swapping stories and you better believe what he's doing is he's listening. He's not just talking. He's not the only one just preaching a sermon there, right? He's listening to all these other people that are with him. So, doubling back to my story about the calf, you know, I did this for a couple of days. I'd go in the calf and I would sit there and I would think, okay, 
who am I going to eat with today? And then I would always just find myself sitting by myself. And, um, and it was kind of sad, honestly. Like, I missed home. I missed my friends. But then one day I decided, you know what? I'm just going to, I know that it would be safe. I know that it would be safer for me to sit by myself. Because when I sit by myself, I don't have to let people in. I don't have to let them know who I am. I don't have to open myself to who, who they are. I don't have to listen. I can just have a monologue with my own self. And, but I started, I started, you know, I said, I'm going to just scoot on closer to these guys. And so I started scooting closer to this group of people. And, and, and soon enough, you know, as I scooted on closer, they invited me into their conversation. And I made some great friends. And when I left that lunchroom, 10 years later, which it was almost 10 years later because <laughs> I worked there, um, I remembered, I walked through there and I, I, I was doing this with all the areas of campus and I walked through there and I was praying and I remember all of the wonderful conversations that I had with people. All of the students' lives that had been changed, all of the uh, times that I was in relationship with somebody, all the mentors that I had that we ate lunch there, all those different stories came flooding back into my mind, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful to be a part of that community. So, I want you to join me at the table. I'm going to ask you a question here. I want you to think about a relationship that you have with somebody. So go ahead and reflect on this really quick. Think about a relationship you have with somebody who's different than you. Is this a monologue relationship where you control the conversation? What could you do differently to make this a more mutual relationship and have a posture of pouring yourself out? And while you reflect on this, I'm going to invite my next friend up, Bill. He's going to come up and help me with the next passage. How's it going, Bill? Good. Bill, microphone? yeah, you can take that microphone. Microphone? Sorry. All right. Um, Bill, I was curious, do you like fast food? Uh, yeah. You do? I do eat. What's your, what's your like, go-to fast food place? Uh, Wendy's. Wendy's. Uh, Dave's yeah. Double No Pickle. I think Wendy's is a good option. <laughs> Dave's Double No Pickle. Wendy's is a good option because it's, you know, it tastes, it tastes better than most fast food, but yet it's still a good price, so. Yeah, uh, cost wasn't so much an issue. Okay. I just like when it's juicy. Okay, yeah, that's good. <laughs> well, Bill's going to read Luke chapter 24 for us this morning. This one? <clears throat> so they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if they were going to go farther. <clears throat> but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, <clears throat> for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. <clears throat> so he went in to stay with them. <clears throat> When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn with us while he was talking to us on the road, while he opened up, when he opened to us the scriptures? Thanks, Bill. Yeah, so I think if you're unfamiliar with this passage, just a little bit of background, this is after Jesus um, was resurrected. And this is on the road to Emmaus. He encounters these disciples who are walking to Emmaus and he kind of comes alongside them, right? He kind of just barges in the conversation and is talking about these things and asking them about what's going on. And, and they don't recognize him. They don't recognize him until they get to this table where he breaks the bread and then they see. So Bill, I was curious. <clears throat> You know, if, if you were driving down the road and there was a hitchhiker, not that, I'm, not that I'm advocating to pick up hitchhikers, not that I'm not. Okay. Well, as it's if, fine. You, it's if like, you're let's driving down the road it. and there's this hitchhiker there and you pick him up and, you know, you guys are driving to wherever you're going and you start talking, do you think that you would recognize Jesus? You think, if that was Jesus, do you think you would recognize him? Why or why not? Yeah, I think I would. Yeah? Um, I think... With Jesus as his presence, his presence of listening, knowing, and his open heart, I think I'd recognize if somebody came into my car yeah. with that kind of presence. Yeah. You know, where he would, it wouldn't be like some 
regular person. I think his words, his just presence himself, would be like, what? Oh. Who's this? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's you want to go to Wendy's? <laughs> you want to go to Wendy's? That's right. <laughs> so, Bill, let me ask you this question. What, what is Jesus like to you? Uh, he's kind of the calm with my angst. Mm -hmm. uh, quells so maybe, my he fear. Calms, maybe he calms your road rage as you're driving. That's how you kind of know. That it does Jesus. help, yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. I'm, I'm crazy. I got a super speed twin turbo car, and I'm usually 20 miles an hour over the speed limit <laughs> all the time. Don't confess <laughs> that up here. It's on okay, video. That's all right. <laughs> you know, I think Jesus also has a whole bunch of, uh, you know, guardian angels for me because I'm not dead yet. But I think, what he, you know, as far as my sadness, he fills my heart. You know, my anger, he calms me. Uh, you know, just the presence, and it's, I have to trust in him. Because if I do things my way, I'm not going to get the best out of life. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, Bill. Thanks for sharing that. Would you guys give Bill a round of applause for being up here and for sharing? You can take your... You can take it to go, take it to go plate, I guess. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting to me in this passage that Christ reveals, Christ is revealed to us in the breaking of bread, right? The disciples don't recognize him while he is teach. He's literally teaching them on the road, and they don't recognize him on the road and until literally he, he's walking right beside them. It's not until they sit at the table and he breaks the bread with them. Have you guys ever been through a drive-thru? Come on. Anybody been, to a, been through a drive-thru? Nobody wants to admit it, but everybody's done it. Okay, that's fine. Um, you, you know, when you go through it, we had this, I had this friend in, in college, and he, he was from Chile, and he always told the stuff that he loved about American culture, and then always told the stuff that he hated about American culture. And the drive through was something he despised about American culture, okay? Because when you go through a drive through what are you doing? You're going through because you need convenience, right? You're trying to get somewhere, so you need to eat in the car on the way to wherever you're going. Um, you know, I, I have actually found a much better option for the drive through especially at Chick-fil-A, is an online mobile order beforehand. Because then you just pull up, you get, I mean, because Chick-fil-A drive through anyway, that's a different story. Um, so, you know, I think... As I'm thinking about this story, I'm wondering if they recognize Christ in this moment because they simply slowed down enough to be present with him at the table. Like, I, I'm wondering if that was it. If that was just like the thing. You know, they were too busy walking and worrying to realize that Jesus was walking right beside them the whole time. But then when they slowed down, they sat with him, they became present. And they realized that Jesus was actually right in front of them. And so I think it's that. But I also think there is something unique in taking, a pl uh, taking place at the table here. And, and it's a transformative experience. It's a transformative experience where this everyday, ordinary act of breaking bread becomes sacred. Right? Where grain and grape meet flesh and blood. Where the secular is transformed by the sacred. I think at the table, and as Jesus breaks bread with his disciples, he bridges this sacred and secular gap. And he says, I am actually filling all things, right? And everything becomes sacramental. And if you're unfamiliar with that word sacramental, all of the ordinary is filled with Christ, right? Every physical act or object is consecrated by the divine and leads us into a deeper relationship with God and with others, bringing us into communion with all of creation. That's what's taking place here. It's amazing. Alexander Schmemann, he is a Orthodox, he was an Orthodox um, priest. He wrote a wonderful book. It's fairly small and, and easy to read. It's called For the Life of the World. And this is what he says in it. A Christian is the one who, wherever he looks, finds Christ and rejoices in him. And this joy transforms all of his human plans and programs, decisions and actions, making all his mission the sacrament of the world's return to him who is the life of the world. And so what he's saying in this book is that Jesus, that Christ is the life of the world. 
and that in everywhere you go, in every act you, you do, in every person you see, you can see the presence of Christ. In every hitchhiker you pick up, you can see the presence of Christ there. And so at this table, what he's doing is he is opening our eyes to be present to his presence around us. So I'm going to ask you this question too. I'm going to invite you back into the conversation here. Where have you noticed the presence of Christ this week? Reflect on this. Where have you noticed the presence of Christ this week? Was he in something common or ordinary? And I want you to give thanks for the gift of his presence. And as you're doing this, I'm going to invite Jolene up. and She's going to be our last supper guest. And Jolene, I'm going to get your, set your plate here. And how are you today? I'm good, thanks. Have you recovered from our hike? It took several days. Me too. Several days. I felt Jolene. it in places I didn't know I had. Yeah, Jolene went on a, a very intense hike with the hiking group a few weeks ago, and we barely made it. I guess that's, that's we all didn't. we didn't. You we and did. I didn't. <laughs> we didn't make it. You're right. <laughs> Jolene and I had to stop, so that's fine. Um, Jolene, can you read this passage from, this last passage from Mark chapter 14? Sure. This is Mark 14, 17 to 25. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? And he said to him, them, It is one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Thanks, Jolene. Um, I got a question for you. What do you think it would be like to eat with Jesus, to drink from the same cup? Do you think he'd be like the life of the party, or do you think he'd be the kind of quiet one in the background? Yes. Yes. I like that answer. I think he could be both. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about this in this very non-spontaneous format, but I was thinking about over the last three years, these all, all these men had been with Jesus, all these people, and over three years, if they ate three meals a day, they'd eaten probably over 3,000 meals with Jesus. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. And, and how different all of those meals would have been, but what an interesting meal this is, because what they don't know about this meal is it's their last meal together. Yeah. And it's not, like, it seems like they're having a nice Passover, and all of a sudden Jesus throws this wrench in and creates a little bit of havoc. Right. Is it me? Is it me? Like, and they didn't, and what struck me is they didn't necessarily know themselves, and they didn't necessarily know each other. Right. Yeah. And he sort of answers their question, but not really. Mm -hmm. But then he offers them himself. And the, it says here, especially about the wine, and they all drank. They all drank and they all ate. Yeah. And so even though he gave them parts of himself, the story unfolds just as God designed it to. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to leave and you can just finish. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, that's fantastic. So I'm going to throw this image up on the screen here. Well, I'm not Sasha's, but... Um, this, this is an image that I have in my office, actually. And I just took a picture of it, and here it is. Um, it's called the Mystical Supper. Um, I got it from this Orthodox church, and, and it's this icon of what, what is meant to be kind of the Last Supper here. Uh, and as you're looking at this, what, what are some of the things that stick out to you that you see in this um, image here? Besides the fact they're all wearing helmets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, I know, yeah, besides that. 
You know, one of the things that I notice is that some of them are looking at Jesus, some of them are looking away. Um, but it's, it's clear that Jesus is, is offering them something. Yeah. And all of their relationship, given their positioning in the painting, shows that they each have a different relationship to yeah. Jesus. And yet all of them are welcome, all of them are invited. Yeah, that's good. Would you guys give Jolene a hand? Thanks, Jolene. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think as you look at this image, a couple of things for me is that it draws us in, right? It, there's like a place right there in the front of it that you're actually kind of meant to be participating in. Um, it draws us in, and, and as you look at the disciples, they are all turned toward Christ. And they actually, if you look closely, they all have a hand open, ready to receive in some sort of way. In fact, the only one who isn't turned towards Christ is the one who's on the end there, and I think that's a representation of Judas, who is actually turned away from Christ, and his hand is over, not open, but closed over what is probably meant to be the money box there. So I find this really interesting because everyone is invited to this table, but not everyone is necessarily participating in this table, this, in the same way, at least. So in this passage, we all participate in the act of eating and drinking, and that very act unifies us with Christ and with each other. We are all sharing in one body, in one blood, together at the table of the Lord. And as we turn towards this table, we are drawn in together by Christ, gathered around the table. When I, I went to China a few years ago, and um, not a few years ago, it was like three years ago, it was before COVID. Um, but when I was in China, it just was this beautiful culture. Um, and, and while I was there, we would go out to eat at these different places, and the way that they ate was amazing. In fact, the way that they gathered themselves around a table was, was really important to them. And so when you met a Chinese person on the street and you said hello, the first thing that they would say after hello was, have you eaten? Because it was that important to them that you had eaten. And if not, they would literally like take you to their house and give you a meal. <laughs> it wasn't like, what do you do? Or how are you? You know, it was just like, hey, have you eaten? Um, and, and, and so we would go to these places and we would eat. And, and at these places, there was this giant round table that we would sit at. And we had a big, pretty big group of people. And uh, in the middle of the table was this Lazy Susan. And they would bring out all these dishes and they would set them on this Lazy Susan. And in front of us, they would set this plate that was like this big. I'm not kidding you. It was like a, it was like a I don't even know, like a bread plate here. And, um, and wh what they were essentially saying is that they would pass this Lazy Susan around and people would just pick off of this Lazy Susan, as it went by. And, and, and I think the cool thing about that is you would eat just never more than a, a few bites at a time because the food didn't belong to you. It belonged to everybody. It wasn't just your food. This wasn't just my plate. It belonged to everybody. And, and the people next to you, actually, this is the really cool part, is they would pick stuff up off of the Lazy Susan and they would put it on your plate. And the, as if to say, like, here, try this next. Um, their value of communal relationships was seen even in the beautiful picture of what it means to, sorry, their value of the beautiful relationships was seen even in the way they ate. It was a culture surrounded and anchored in relationship. I saw this as a beautiful picture of what it means to join in, turning toward one another as the food draws them into communion. And so I am tired of eating by myself. I would rather eat with all of you. And so as we come to the table this morning, I want to say this. I did this this morning, and, and I, didn't, I didn't do it lightly. I know some, some people might think, oh man, he was just like feasting on the body and blood of Christ with people. And, and that wasn't a light thing. Because as we talked about earlier, this is all sacred, right? Every meal that you eat with somebody, every time you crack open a beer with somebody, whatever it looks like, 
That is a sacred moment of communion. And so as we come to the table this morning, the church, which we've talked about in the past several weeks, the church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. But in this crazy, weird, mystical way, it is sustained by the sacramental body of Christ. And every week we come together to receive, to dine together at the table of the Lord on flesh and blood of Christ. It sustains us. It gives us life. It draws us together. You know, for most of church history, the sacrament, not the sermon, was kind of the main point of the service. It has been the central aspect of worship. When the table is central, our faith becomes more about connecting our lives to Christ and each other than about gaining some spiritual information. Brian Zahn in his book, Water to Wine, writes this, what the sacrament of communion does that the sermon cannot do is offer the worshiper a direct encounter with the life of Christ. Because as you partake of this, you are encountering Christ. Christ is encountering you. And in some strange, crazy way, we're all encountering each other at this table. And so, on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he was with his disciples in the upper room and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant, poured out in his blood for us, for the forgiveness of sins. And he said, this blood shed for you. So every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance. And as you guys come this morning, I would encourage you to come knowing that you are encountering Christ, knowing that you are encountering each other in community, even as you come to the table. So we have some baskets on both sides and there's some little pieces of bread in there. And then there's also some cups and the cups without a lid on it are wine and the cups with a lid on it are juice. And so um, I'm going to have those who are serving communion come forward. And as we serve this morning, and as you receive this morning, receive the body of Christ. So over the next few weeks and beyond that, we're going to have some opportunities to sign up for some community groups. And if one, you're like, I don't know what that is, then come talk to me or come talk to one of the staff members and we can tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, but two, I, I don't want you to do this because I want you to do it, even though I want you to do it. And I don't want you to do it because you feel like you have to do it. But I want this to be a longing and a desire of your heart to be in relationship, to be connected with a smaller group of people. I hope you feel connected here, and that's great. But I, I hope that there is also that group of people that you can really be known by and to know. And so, um, you know, I wanted to point this out one more time today before we leave. It says community. and. I don't know if you can totally see it from back there, but it's this intricate, intricate, messy, chaotic strings all over the place. But yet when they come together, it makes this beautiful image of community. And that's what we are. That's who we are. Different people from all over the place with all sorts of different things, but yet here we are in community with each other. So go today, eat with somebody. Go eat with somebody today in his presence and in his peace.